have your foot. Five hundred pound general purpose bombs. They're just for aerial uh, bombing. Yeah, just for like carpet bombing, basically, uh, for fragmentation. And then we have our seven hundred fifty pound ones. We drop also over there. We also carry CBU bombs, some munitions in them. We'll drop yeah. those also. Yeah. And we also carry naval mines, which we can drop. Yeah, we carry uh, both nuke and conventional payloads. We're able to carry twenty cruise missiles. We're able to carry up to 51 conventional bombs, internal and external, combined. Um, this is the shaft. This is what we've been launching the Calcums off of. But right now we got B83 on there and a B61. They're both nuclear ordinances, and they're for penetration down in the bunkers and stuff. On the bottom, you can't see it. That's the Alcum. That's another cruise missile right there. And then are the advanced cruise missiles. We carry 12 of them, six on each wing. And they're. Uh, Nuclear too, carry a nuke and a conventional. Manche Probleme können nur mit einem gewaltigen Knall gelöst werden, wird gesagt. Die B-52 ist mit der Lösung solcher Probleme beauftragt. Sie ist ein Aggregat von extremen Kräften und technischer Intelligenz mit einem weitreichenden Vernichtungspotenzial. Yes, the B-52 is a very large aircraft. The length of the fuselage is actually 159 feet 4 inches. It is uh, 40 feet to the top of the tail, and uh, the wingspan is 185 feet long. It's also uh, very heavy. Just uh, basic weight of the aircraft is uh, on average 184,000 pounds. Uh, we calculate all of our fuel loads in pounds also, and uh, aircraft total weight that it can take off with, including weapons, would be uh, 488,000 pounds. This has uh, eight Pratt & Whitney TF-33 engines. Uh, each of them produces uh, approximately 17,000 pounds of thrust. We use what's called JP-8. It's a jet fuel combination of diesel and kerosene. Some of the first things we check are the emergency equipment. We bring on our uh, emergency generators. If we were to lose all electrical power, we'd have power to some of our important instruments like the attitude indicator, the uh, heading indicator, and uh, our standby attitude indicator here. Once we do that, we start checking the fuel quantity, make sure all the gauges are working, that they're reading correctly. We take individual readings of all the gauges, total them up, and then uh, look at that, make sure it agrees with the totalizer gauge here, which is right there. After we get done with that, we start checking some of the hydraulic systems. I have all the hydraulic control panels on my side. We, we get the ground crew involved at this point because he'll go outside and check, make sure all the flight controls are uh, moving the correct direction as we move the yoke and the, the rudder pedals and everything. Look here in the lower part in the belly of the aircraft. Electronic Warfare Officer uses all this stuff here. It's a bunch of antennas and stuff. Used for defense of the aircraft. So this aircraft was in war. That's what the Electronic Warfare Officer's job is, is to protect this aircraft from getting shot down. There's no way we can hide, so what we do is try to buy some time. And that's my job. What uh, the radar energy, what I try to figure out is the frequency of the radar energy that's, that's uh, being sent to us. 
And what I do is we're already sending them enough that they can figure out where we are. I send them a bunch back so that they they get a huge picture or in some cases they can get more than one more than one picture in different locations so they can't figure out who we are or what we're doing. So in a way you're deceiving them or right? Yes. Uh, did, Sending wrong I, signals, I can yeah. I have the capability to deceive or to just fill up their they have a radar scope that tells them where we are and uh, it should be a little blip well I can give them a huge blip so that they can't tell once again they you know right. they can't exactly. tell you are, what your shape right. is yeah, what and, your target uh, is yeah. you know like I said I can't hide but I can hide the aircraft but I can try to prevent us from from getting shot these are the Fleur and STV turrets uh, one of them's infrared they use these uh, mainly to aid them flying at night it helps them see the infrared You can see a lot, uh, it picks up heat, so they can see stuff in the air. Uh, that's the main function of these, is to see at night, but also during the day, they can still see on the ground. You saw the two uh, turrets out in the front of the aircraft. Uh, those unstow so we can slew them uh, left and right to yeah. take a look at various things. Yeah. Uh, What's that, for example? Well, this right here is our computer control panel. We do have computers. This is how I control that. Uh, we load we load up the computer, and what we have is software. And you can see these empty uh, places here. They're called uh, data transfer unit cartridges. They weigh about, I guess, 10 pounds a piece. They're, you know, they're hardened against any kind of uh, uh, nuclear blast, which say we've got any EMP pulses from that. But uh, we load up our computer, and you can see here, this is how we control our computer. And if you notice, when you press these, it's not something where you can make a mistake and touch lightly like our... Uh, what we use now for our keyboards. So, <laughs> kind of outdated, but we have to make a conscious effort for whatever input we put into the system uh, whenever we're doing something. So, it keeps us from making mistakes. You got to be very diligent when you do it. Uh, we also have just tons of other panels to take a look at. We do have our uh, various weapon control panels over in here. And uh, the weapon control panel helps us affect uh, uh, releases that. Uh, is related to our nuclear capability with uh, missiles as well as uh, nuclear bombs and we use this panel to do that. Aircraft wings have such a big degree of flex, they flex uh, 18 feet total. Once we have a heavy fuel load on it, the wings will go dip down towards the ground and you know, we'll, we need these tip protection gear out there on the wings to uh, actually stabilize the wing tips. If there's a crosswind when we're landing or taking off, we can line the gear up with the runway, but the nose of the aircraft is actually pointing into the wind. So the gear is going this way and the nose of the aircraft that way and it'll take off that way. I see the red light over The abandoned light, basically it's the light that I use to notify the crew that they need to prepare to bail out of the aircraft. A blinking red light means prepare to bail out. A steady red light means to bail out. I've never seen a used in flight. We use uh, an air source outside the aircraft to uh, start the, the start the engines turning, and then once we get uh, a certain RPM, we, th we bring the throttle up out of uh, close, it puts the gas into the, the engine, and we get ignition and we start the engines that way. We start four, and we start five. Those provide us two of our main hydraulic systems to, to have brakes and everything set, uh, so when we start the rest of them, once we get aircraft power and cooling air, the offense team can start bringing their systems up downstairs. They'll start bringing up their, their bomb nav computers and the radars and everything, make sure they're all working, and uh, we get ready to taxi the aircraft out to, uh, to the hammerhead. Dies ist das erste Modell der B-52. Das Flugzeug wurde 1948 an einem Wochenende in einem Hotel in Dayton, Ohio von sieben Boeing-Ingenieuren konzipiert, berechnet und modelliert. Das Pentagon hatte ihnen Zeit bis Montagmorgen gegeben, eine Waffe für den Kalten Krieg zu entwerfen. Der Kalte Krieg war losgegangen, bevor es überhaupt die entsprechenden Waffen gab, ihn strategisch auszutragen. Die erste öffentliche Vorstellung des Flugzeugs, 1952. Ein Mädchen auf dem Atomwaffenbomber. Wie geht das zusammen? Der Kalte Krieg und eine Freizeituniform. Das Versuchsmodell YB52 aus 100.000 Einzelteilen zusammengesetzt. Gleich in den ersten Bildern vom Bomber wird sichtbar, dass das Flugzeug zuallererst einmal ein Arbeitsplatz war. 
Innerhalb von zehn Jahren wurden 740 B-52 Bomber gebaut, in mehreren Entwicklungsstufen vom A-Modell bis zum H-Modell. Die gesamte Kapazität der Aluminium verarbeitenden Industrie der USA war auf eine Dekade hin ausgelastet. Höchstgeschwindigkeit 1000 km in der Stunde, Flughöhe maximal 15.000 Meter, Reichweite mit einer Tankfüllung je nach Modell zwischen 10.000 und 16.000 km. Der Bomber kann allerdings in der Luft nachbetankt werden. Acht Düsentriebwerke, die in Gondeln von den Flügeln herabhängen, pfeilförmige Flügel, die hoch oben am Rumpf angebracht sind. Castle Air Force Base, California, home of the first B-52 Intercontinental Bomber Squadron. And there is Colonel William R. Smith of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, commanding officer of the new Combat Crew Training Squadron. Well, the 93rd Bomb Wing Captain is the first SAC unit, combat unit, to receive B-52 aircraft. My unit, the 4017th Combat Crew Training Squadron, is a part of the 93rd Bomb Wing. And as such, it's our responsibility to train all SAC B-52 crews. If you'll forgive me for not mentioning any performance factors, as you know, they're still classified. Colonel Smith, what would you, uh, I wonder if you could tell us what the cost of the B-52 is. You mentioned that each aircraft cost $12 million. Uh, is that the uh, aircraft being produced at the present time? No, no don't mention that. Yeah. You've been talking no, about no, it. Oh, no, 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 Colonel Smith, I'd like to get some information as to the cost of the B-52. Can you give us any information on that? I think so, Captain. <coughs> I, excuse me. I believe the... Colonel Smith, how about the cost of the B-52? Hey, I believe the cost of the first B-52 prototypes, the XB and the YB, was some $12 million dollars a unit. But now that they're into... Uh, full production at the plant, I believe it's some six million dollars per unit. And if you out there have uh, enough money to buy 6,000 Chevrolets, why that'll just about do it for one B-52. How about the overall length, Colonel? Well, as far as the uh, size of the airplane is concerned, uh, wingtip to wingtip, it's uh, greater than the width of a football field. And uh, the tail is some 50 feet high, some four stories in the air. Bewaffnung im Heck, zuerst vier 50 mm Maschinengewehre, später ein 20 mm Schnellfeuergeschütz. Bombennutzlast über 10 Tonnen. That was a very common sight and I picked that because of the B-52. In those days, that represented to our country the strength of our country, the B-52. I mean, if you took one piece of, of military machinery, that was it. And to this day, it's still being used. Um, but it represented uh, the strength of our country, the protection of our country. You talk to crews who were on the B-52, I mean, it, they always tear up. I mean, it's, it was a very endearing aircraft to those people because they knew what it meant. I put part of the SAC logo in the cloud. People will look at that painting and they'll do a double take. You know, they don't see it immediately. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to give that impression because that aircraft really represented SAC of all the aircraft that they flew, and they flew quite a few. But if you really pinpoint one aircraft that meant so much to the Strategic Air Command, it would, be, it would have to be the B-52. What about this one here? Well, this, this painting I did, that represents the most significant aircraft that SAC flew in its, in its entire history. Uh, starting with the B-29, which was a carryover from World War II, that was our main bomber at that point when SAC was formed. Uh, And then it, it jumped to the B-36, and then the B-47, and then came, and that's why I, in particular, painted the B-52 so big, because it was really the backbone. But a lot of people don't realize that, that SAC had fighter squadrons, P-51s, directly after the war, that had that job of escorting the bombers. Where's the vanishing point? There's two types of perspective, mechanical and artistic. 
and so artists can take a little bit of a license. But your vanishing point would have to be oh. somewhere back in here. Yeah. But my 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 mission here was to show as realistically as possible because this could never happen. Flying all these in particularly that tight of formation, uh, all of the aircraft as realistically as I could. Mm -hmm. So doing, an, doing as many aircraft paintings, uh, that's why I put the clouds in here because I wanted to highlight the missiles in the background. So hopefully these aircraft have gone by before they shoot the missiles up. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the point here. This is not glorifying war. In fact, if anything, this is glorifying peace. The fact that we have come up with these weapons of mass destruction in a time in our world's history we needed to do. But thank God we have not had to use them. You, you see what I mean? Sure. The aircraft, to me, the aircraft is, is, a, is a piece of beauty, uh, but it represents to me the strength of our country, the strength of peace, the strength of determination. Uh, it's not glorifying the idea of, yeah, let's go out and bomb somebody. No, the fact that we, we, if we have to, we can. But I wondered, who's the enemy here? What's the target? Where do they go to? You know, th their motto was, peace was, peace is our profession. Deterrent was the main thing. There was only one, well, actually two, atomic bombs dropped in anger, ever. And those were the first two. That deterrent guaranteed that really those missiles were never used in anger because of, of the absolute devastating power it had. Um, so it, to me, that's why I put these in the background because you, we knew and the world knew they were there. We had that capability. And thank God that we never had to use it. But maybe because of the fact that we had it, we didn't have to use it. To somebody walking into the SAC Museum, I wanted them to look at my painting and really have the entire story of SAC right there, as far as the mechanics of it. And that was, that was my goal. Yeah. When I'm talking, you listen. When you're talking, I'm gonna listen. Now here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you all 45 seconds to get out of your system, whatever you have when you say to marry Harry Perry, what? <laughs> and at the end of 45 seconds, you belong to me. How's that? Fair enough? Cool, you got it. <laughs> 100, no, empty or loaded? Loaded about 170,000 pounds. Okay, just follow me around this way, please. Now, we'll go. Let's start. Bis in die 80er Jahre waren die mit Nuklearwaffen ausgerüsteten B-52-Bomber dem strategischen Luftwaffenoberkommando SAC unterstellt. Im SAC-Museum kann man die Überreste der Kommandozentrale sehen, der militärische Mittelpunkt des Kalten Krieges. Das Schaltpult für Kriseneinsätze, das Schaltpult für die Verbindung zum Oberkommando, die Station des oberkommandierenden Generals von SAC, Das Schaltpult für die Notvermittlung. Der Safe für die geheimen Kriegsbefehle. Ein Film, der im Auftrag von SAC produziert wurde. Bis auf die Sequenz, die den Einsatz von Flugzeugen, Raketen und Nuklearbomben in einem endgültigen Schlagabtausch mit der Sowjetunion zeigt, wurde der Film nicht fertig geschnitten. So ist nicht zu erfahren, 
was den imaginären Krieg verursacht hat. This is Omaha, Nebraska, almost unquestionably designated as the number one target area because of the Strategic Air Command headquarters just a few miles south of the city. Should the bomb hit this target, thousands of persons would be instantly Are we killed. capable of stopping an attack from Russia right now? Yes, our Strategic Air Command has a tremendous nuclear power. The yield of its atomic bombs is fantastic. And uh, uh, so at this present time, I don't think Russia will dare to go to war. Die B-52 war auf diese Aufgabe gut vorbereitet. Sie hat bei allen atmosphärischen Nukleartests, die Amerika in den 50er Jahren angestellt hat, die Atombomben abgeworfen. The amount of energy generated by a nuclear explosion is enormous. A mushroom-shaped cloud forms and climbs higher. It now contains billions of highly radioactive particles of matter that we call fallout. Das Wappen von Sack zeigt eine eiserne Faust, die unter der Entladung von Blitzen einen Olivenzweig zerbricht. We had a heck of a time getting off that runway. It, uh, the plane was so fully loaded that uh, it took us forever. He said, when I came back, one guy said, one other navigator said to me, he said, we didn't think you were going to make it. Because, well, the, the mathematics works out. I mean, mathematically, you can. But we never had taken so much runway before. And uh, we flew our airborne alert around Russia. And uh, they said at that time, past any given point on that route, There was an airplane every 12 minutes. And you stop and think about that. That's a lot of B-52s putting up a nuclear fence right there. Usually the Russians would come up and challenge us, and they didn't send up the fighters. But they were silent. And uh, along the whole route that night, there was very little chatter. It was a very tense situation. And, While you uh, were airborne, did you think that this situation might have the potential of an actual strike? Yes, because once they took us off alert, that's the serious situation. That's the war situation. It had never been done before, to my knowledge. And we're holding down an important target. And they took us off alert and assigned us that target airborne. It had never happened to me before. Or the other members of the crew, either. So, to us, It was, it was a situation that this is what's going to turn into reality of, of a war. And throughout the entire flight, there was no communication to us that it was otherwise. That we're in a war situation right now and uh, be prepared. And we frankly did a lot of planning along the route while we were airborne to see if we had to turn. All you had to do is turn right at any given time and you're headed toward Russia. And at various points, we had flight plans prepared in a, in a locked box. And so all we had to do, if we got the code, was simply open the box, pull out the pop, proper plan, and then fly the route with the maps that they provided us there. And we already knew the target because we had U2 pictures, of, not U2 pictures, but uh, information that, uh, you know, what was going on there where the target was and what we were looking for. Of course, for me, it's hard to imagine how one would feel to be potentially in the situation to initiate a nuclear war, to have all the, the means for that at hand. I don't think we were ever thinking about we would initiate, though. Yeah. I don't think we'd ever do a... It was my thought at the time we'd never do a preemptive strike that the Russians had to commit first, and then we would retaliate. In my own personal thought, I thought I would never see my home base again. Not that I would die, but I knew that would be gone. And I just, in thinking on it, during that flight, I just was happy that I wasn't married and had a family like so many of the other crew members did, the older members. Because I didn't think it would be there. 
they did not pull any punches on us. They said that, quite frankly, we're a target. We can generate other nuclear bombers, so don't expect to come back here. That clock ticked very close to midnight. Die Absturzstelle einer B-52 in North Carolina. Sie war mit zwei Nuklearbomben bewaffnet. Are you still on groundwater? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm just going to step around there and take a quick sample, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. When the plane began to spin, the right wing broke off. So the plane twisted in two, halfway. You had a, a bomb in the back, nuclear weapon. You had a nuke in the front. It twisted in two between the two bomb bays. When it came out, so the plane was going down, when it twisted in two, I guess the other wing must have broke because it was spinning to the right. And what they described it or described to me that as the plane was coming down, the nose, when the back came off, the tail end separated, it began to turn up. It would turn up and it was moving forward with the top side going forward. Oh, I and I was awakened by just a weird, weird noise which later turned out to be, as we were told from base personnel, Seymour Johnson, that the plane had started to revolve in the air and was, you know, which created a really strange noise, which is what awakened me, I guess. And as soon as I was awakened, <clears throat> we heard an explosion, a very, very loud explosion, which occurred somewhere back over this area on the other side my mom's house over here. Yeah, it was close to a mile away from the actual site where the, the main part of the plane impacted on the highway right down here, around the curve. And it was just, you know, you were waking to chaos. And base personnel were on the spot, helicopters landing. They were in the air before he crashed, we were told later. This was the order bailout. The navigator go and jettison his hatch. So there's a hole there, and he go out, he jet. The instructor navigator that's sitting behind the two of them jumps out. By that time, I ought to be downstairs to bail out. That was, I suppose, have been the third man out. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't get downstairs. Mm -hmm. So the other ones were safe. They used their ejection seat. The navigator came out okay. The two pilots came out okay. The uh, uh, gunner got out. I believe I said the gunner didn't. No, the gunner didn't get out. The radar, the uh, electronic warfare officer ejected. That was four. I bailed out without ejection seat and went out the top. There was a crew member that was found in a tree about two miles from here. Had parachuted into a tree and had been killed uh, in the parachute. I think he was... He was killed in the tree, probably, and I think he was impaled by a limb. A couple other crew members came up to people's houses in the area. I remember two people in the plane, still in the plane, who were obviously dead probably before it crashed. What do you need the water for? Well, basically, we're analyzing it. Um for uh, things such as uranium, the kind of things that would be inside uh, a nuclear weapon of the design that might have been lost back here or uh, in the field near Farah, that's why. Mm -hmm. and so there is a nuclear weapon down there in the... The, in the, <clears throat> the statements from the Air Force, I understand, were that there was a small piece of a nuclear weapon that they were unable to recover because when the plane broke up, <clears throat> Uh, the two weapons were deployed with chutes. I think one opened up and, and the other one may not have fully opened and it hit the grounds and just went into the loamy soil. Yeah, they were digging up the, the crash site. Actually, it was, it was west of the crash site by probably 150 yards or so. Uh, did they ever tell that there was still another nuclear bomb, most likely? The, the rumor was the that there was a bomb and they were trying to find it and it had gone down. And so, therefore, 
the hole that was dug, which was huge, which encompassed the whole field up there, which is like five or six, seven acres. And they couldn't get it, and they did get it, and they didn't get it, or did they get it, and that was the whole thing. You know, I read stuff, and I've checked things on the Internet to find out as much as I could about it after reading an article um, that explained that it was probably the most serious accident which could have resulted in a nuclear catastrophe that this country had had. You know, there was, the only thing they, that I've been told was there was lost uranium. Some uranium was lost, which meant to me uh, that there was still danger there. If I recall correctly, they had about 17, 18 safety devices. Mm -hmm. So I knew without them being armed, and we yeah. weren't armed until we got over enemy territory, that the nuclear part of the weapon would not go off. Yeah. And it was pretty safe. We would get TNT yeah. explosion, but the nuclear exposure would not. And as I understand it, <laughs> out of all those that was safety devices, uh, only two of them, two or three, kept it from going off. Arsenal von Kernwaffen ist im Nationalen Atommuseum in Albuquerque zu besichtigen. Eine lückenlose Kette der Abschreckungsstrategie, immer nah an der Katastrophe. Yes, over a city in southeastern Spain called Palmeras. It was located on uh, the, the coast of Spain. And at that point in time, the United States had an airborne alert system called Chrome Dome, which involved having bombers flying different flight profiles around the then Soviet Union as a part of our nuclear deterrence. And in order to do that, air-to-air -air refueling was required, and during one of those missions, a B-52 aircraft and a KC-135 tanker collided. You see they're in a refueling uh, uh, link-up at this point in time. And when they collided, uh, and during the breakup of, of the aircraft, uh, the four B-28 weapons that were on board the B-52 fell free from the aircraft. Three of them fell to the, to the land here in Spain, and two of the three detonated. That is to say, the conventional high explosives in the bombs detonated, scattering uh, radioactive materials and plutonium dust and the like around the countryside. Uh, the first bomb was slowed by its parachute, did not impact with the earth at uh, as high a speed as the other two weapons did, uh, so it was uh, found and recovered very quickly, and this is the remnants of bomb number one. Mm -hmm. Now, bomb number four, however, uh, again, as can be seen in this picture, did not fall on the land, but it went out into the Mediterranean Sea. And it was the real difficult problem in the recovery effort because trying to locate it, first of all, and then bring it back from the seabed was a very difficult task. It took some 80 days to uh, actually recover the weapon, to get it back into U.S. possession and on board an American vessel. I actually heard that it was never recovered, it's still today. Well, no, that's not quite so, because we have the remnants yeah. of bomb number four, which okay. was in the sea Let's take a look at it. all that time up here. Um, as can be noted, uh, the damage to this was less severe than was seen on, on the other bomb, but we were fortunate in the respect that had it not been for a Spanish fisherman who saw this bomb descending, 
uh, we might not ever have found it. Uh, he was a gentleman by the name of Simo Ortz. His photo is on this wall. He looks something like the American singer uh, Dean Martin. That's right. Yeah, and uh, that's right. he saw this bomb coming down. It, this weapons parachute had fully deployed and slowing it, but he was at a distance. So what he saw coming down, he thought was one of the air crew members coming down in a parachute. I see. What happened actually to the air crew? Well, several were killed. Um, I believe four of the seven on the B-52 survived. Uh, all members, the, the four members in the tanker perished in the accident. But Orts drew this, this diagram and gave it to the authorities and said, here is where the dead man entered the sea. And with this diagram, the search area was, was made smaller to the point where it could be intensified. The weapon was found and then after uh, some difficulty was raised back to the surface and brought back into American custody. Uh, it was an interesting exercise because not only were we looking for it to try to recover it, but also our friends the Russians were looking for it at the time. And it wasn't a form of technology transfer we were really interested in pursuing with them at that time. Uh, was history. that the reason for the cleanup that was done in the kind well, of radiated and polluted areas? Or? The, the cleanup was a result of bombs two and three detonating when they hit the ground. And when they did, they scattered contamination around the Spanish countryside. And there was some. Well, it's near, nearly 5,000 of the 55-gallon drums that are seen in this photo over here uh, that were filled with that Spanish topsoil removed, and it was, you know, subsequently replaced so that the people in the area could resume their farming and uh, normal activities. Hier sind die Trümmer vom Absturz in Palomares begraben. Gleich daneben die Wrackteile einer B-52, die 1968 in Grönland abgestürzt ist. Die verstrahlte spanische Erde, die von den Feldern abgetragen wurde und das verseuchte Eis von Thule, heimgekehrt in eine amerikanische Wüstenlandschaft. Von 1966 an wurden B-52-Bomber in Vietnam eingesetzt. Zunächst nur Ziele in Südvietnam und in der demilitarisierten Zone, dann auch in Laos und Kambodscha und später gegen Nordvietnam. Es waren vor allem D-Modelle, die einen Kanonier im Heck hatten zur Abwehr von feindlichen Jägern. Der Bomber war von einem Höhenflugbomber umgerüstet worden zu einem Tiefflieger damit er der gegnerischen Radarerkennung entkommen konnte. Und statt Nuklearwaffen wurde er mit konventionellen Bomben bestückt. We could carry 108, but we couldn't carry that many 750 pound bombs internal. We could carry 84, we had uh, stations for 84 bombs in there, but we carried 24 750s external. So we'd have 24 750s external and 84 500s internal. That was the largest load. Though for going to Hanoi, We couldn't carry that much fuel. We lost some fuel of that. We, planes max gross weight's 450,000 pounds. And uh, if you got a lot of uh, fuel and a lot of bombs, so something's got to give if you can go over the 450 mark. So we reduced that bomb load a little bit. And um, we carried some 60, 750 internal and 24 um, 500s external. And also the 500-pound bomb is the, the, the new bomb, the Mark 82, was more streamlined. It was for the modern jet fighters, and it didn't have the drag on the airplane as the 750-pound bomb did. But they found out that when you carry 108 500-pound bombs, uh, you can train those, drop them in a train 6,000 feet long and 3,000 feet wide, one airplane. And so you could take three bombers, which were a, a normal cell, You could expand that to the width and make that 9,000 feet across, 6,000 long, or you could make it 18,000 long, or you could put it all in the same 6,000 and by 3,000, and uh, would use it uh, uh, as area bombing in, uh, in support of uh, the troops.
I went over and talked to wing commander, and he said he had selected me and nominated me to the general officer over there to lead the first raid against Hanoi. And that was to be on the 18th of December. We hit uh, very hard industrial targets in, in the perimeter right downtown Hanoi. Uh, Kinno storage complex, uh, uh, SAM sites, uh, SAM locations, SAM fabrication center where they put the SAM missile and everything together and storage centers for that. Uh, rail, major rail centers. And uh, we got shot at pretty heavily by surface to air missiles. Some were successful. I led that group out of Guam. And the mission time on that was um, almost 20 hours in the air. And uh, we landed in uh, 13 hours crew rest, and then we flew on the 20th. It was 18th, 19th, and 20th. Uh, I was a deputy lead on the 20th out of Guam. And we had a bad night that night. We lost six B-52s were shot down uh, in total of the total force. And uh, it was a pretty rough night. Uh, then I came back out of that mission, and... Uh, didn't fly again. We th there was a stand down at Christmas time, and uh, apparently it was another attempt to try to get the peace thing started, which failed. And then uh, I was told that the 26 were going to resume bombing, and I would lead that one. Turned out to be 120 B-52s, uh, out of included Guam and uh, Utapau, and uh, major force. And we. Um, the targets, uh, Hanoi Railroad Yards and the Kinno Complexes. The Kinno Complex, a big storage area of supplies and that was quite huge. Uh, <coughs> we went after uh, Radio Hanoi, we went after uh, communication, uh, command and control of communication areas, airfields, uh, the whole basket of, of uh, strategic targets. The mission on the 24th went to Cap Airfield. The second mission I flew was on the 26th, the day after Christmas. Uh, that was the biggest uh, mission of the of the 11 day war 120 aircraft were involved with it 45 of us from Utapau and the, and the remainder 75 were from uh, from Guam uh, there was a a big scramble and there's some delays and I was the last uh, squad uh, last flight to take off last crew to, uh, to excuse me cell to take off from Utapau and because of the delays we were about 30 minutes late in getting off the ground once we headed off to the north from Utapau, uh, I was to connect up with a flight of G models from Guam because they felt that a D model cell at the back end of a G model wave would protect them from fighters sneaking up and things of that sort. So when I found out that they were about 150 miles straight north of me because I was, I was late, then we, we brought up our power and we were able to cut the distance down to about 15 minutes, but we were still 15 minutes late coming in on the target. Mind you, everyone else had already dropped their weapons and were gone, and we're coming in 15 minutes late. So I called uh, Red Crown in the Tonkin Gulf, the, the picket ship, and I said, "Don't let the fighter cap above us leave until I finish, you know, because we don't want to be up there by ourselves." So when we came in on the target, it seemed like they were a lot more concentration towards us, and the Sams were coming up in, in large numbers, um, and they would just sort of come up and, and level off at your altitude and come back look like they're coming right at you and you have to kind of stare them down a little bit because until he gets close enough where you can make a maneuver it's not you're wasting your time uh, that's when the gunner was very important to me because he was able to tell me from the rear where the sams were coming from and which way to maneuver the aircraft to avoid them mm -hmm. so we were doing a lot of maneuvering and uh, on our bomb run in on we were bombing the Th uh, Thai Nguyen, Nguyen uh, steel factory north uh, west of uh, Hanoi at that time. And then we broke and turned back towards the Chinese border on our exit out of out of North Vietnam. Did you hit this target of the steel yes. factory? Yes, we yeah. sure did. Do you have any idea how much of a payload you dropped over Vietnam overall? Oh, me myself? Yeah. I had probably uh, close to 100 missions. Uh, I would guess I was carrying uh, 40, 48,000 pounds roughly, 48 to 50,000 pounds. Most of them 66, 750 pound bombs. So if you hit, hit 50,000 times 100, I suppose that would be something like the pounds that I dropped over, over North Vietnam. On the 22nd December, the B-52 start bombing our railway station. On the 25th, my wife came back to Hanoi. At night of uh, 26 December, at around 
quarter to 11 p.m. Uh, when I, I heard about the sirens warning about the uh, airstrike. Uh, the loudspeaker at that time said that the uh, U.S. aircraft are far from Hanoi from 30 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 10 kilometers, and they reach Hanoi. At that time, all the people run the tunnel to hide from the bombing. And I start to hear about the, hear, uh, the shooting of our missile in the sky at around 11.35 p.m. The B-52 start, start the bombing and the loudspeaker at that time said that two B-52 were shot down and uh, during that time I was in my office. So when the bombing finished, I came back to my home and found that my wife, my sister and my son and two of my cousins were killed because, because of one 50 kilo, kilo bombs which fall uh, into the tunnel. Totally 26 people there were killed, including my relatives. Trong vòng 12 ngày đêm mà máy bay B-52 ném bom không thiên thì họ ném nó ném bao nhiêu lần tất cả có thường xuyên có như thế là và 12 ngày đêm tức là liên tục nó đánh suốt cả ngày cả đêm coi như là không có giờ giấc trước kia còn đánh còn có giờ giấc như về sau còn cứ đánh liên tục during the 12 day war the bombing happened around the clock all the night and all the day after coming back from my office, I, dis I found that the, all the houses were destroyed at that time and the area uh, were totally flattened. So my, one of my brother told me that my wife was killed as well as my son. But at that time, my wife, I, at first, I found my wife's, my wife's body. So as uh, she was cut, half the body and my son and my son I found a little bit later but uh, about my elder brother only two months later I found him uh, where inside the, the destroyed houses Die Kham Tien Straße nach der Bombardierung im Dezember Tôi, tôi là người thứ hai bắn Beta 2 chứ không không phải là người đầu tiên. Uh, I'm the second pilot who shot down the B-52. I'm not the first one. Mm -hmm. Tôi này là tôi bắn ở vùng Hà Nội. Còn bạn tôi là bắn ở trong đường chín Lào Lào. I shot the B-52, shot down the B-52 near Hanoi. Mm -hmm. uh, but my friend uh, shot down B-52 in the uh, uh, num uh, road number nine uh, in the uh, 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 across the Laos border. Mm -hmm. Lần đó là bạn tôi chỉ bắn có một quả tên lửa. And at that time my friend shot only one missile. Nên là máy bay về về bị thương về bên 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 Thái Lan rồi. And the B52 was injured at that moment and it crashed in Thailand. Thế và tôi sau đó rút kinh nghiệm là quyết định là phải bắn hai quả. And I uh, I took the lessons from that and uh, I shot two missiles and my air battle took place in uh, West South Hanoi. Đây này là đường bay của của không quân Mỹ là đi qua từ phía tây lên qua Lào và vào phía tây nam Hà Nội đi đấy các US force came from the west south direction from Laos to Laos. Uh, tôi cất cánh và bám vào đội B52 vào đến khoảng gần Hà Nội thì bắn. I uh, try to follow the B52 uh, uh, near Hanoi and, and start shooting. Thế thì ông biết là máy bay B52 nó bay được cao 10 cây. Uh, you may know that the B-52 flew at the uh, high altitude of 10 kilometers. Thế mà bắn bằng tên lửa phòng không, tên lửa của không quân. So uh, uh, we can shoot them down by the missiles. Nên là không phải lúc nào họ tống bảo vệ được máy bay. So the jet fighters uh, couldn't be able always to protect B-52. Nên là lợi dụng cái sơ hở thì chúng tôi hoàn toàn có khả năng là đánh được. And we took advantage of this and crash and shot down, shoot down the B-52. After shooting the B-52 near Hanoi, uh, I was uh, informed not to fly over Hanoi. Mm -hmm. 
because it's what's so dangerous. Because it's 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 so dangerous. và gây ra một cái cuộc giết chóc nhân dân thảm khốc nhất và hủy các nhà máy các cầu đường các trường học các bệnh viện để làm cho người việt nam phải chết sợ và nhận những cái những cái điều kiện của mình. And accepting all the conditions from the U.S. side. Tức là, là đánh bại cái ý chí chiến đấu của của Bắc Việt Nam và buộc phải nhận những cái điều kiện của mình. They wanted to defeat the sense of fighting from the Vietnamese side. Yeah, thì tôi có đặt vấn đề là uh, cho phòng không không quân là tôi hỏi là tiêu diệt mấy phần trăm mấy năm hai thì nghỉ là là không chịu được. Uh, in making the preparation for uh, for the defending of uh, our country at that time, I put the question that how how many percentage of the number of the B-50 bomber will be shot down uh, in order to make the U.S. Uh, stop the war in Vietnam? Thì cơ quan nghiên cứu của chúng tôi là trả lời cho tôi là bảy phần trăm. The researching institutes in Vietnam gave me the answer that around seven percent. Nhưng mà thực tế đến cái ngày hôm bảy thì là hạ là có thể là mười bảy phần trăm. But up to the twenty seventh of December nineteen seventy two, we shot down seventeen percent. Zwischen dem 18. und dem 29. Dezember wurden 730 Einsätze geflogen. 15.000 Tonnen Sprengstoff wurden abgeworfen. 1.300 Vietnamesen wurden getötet. Die meisten Zivilisten. 880 SAM-Raketen wurden auf die B-52-Bomber abgefeuert. 24 wurden getroffen, 15 stürzten ab. 30 Amerikaner kamen dabei um. 30 gerieten in Kriegsgefangenschaft. sagt man der Vietnamkrieg, in Vietnam sagt man der Amerikakrieg, in Amerika sagt man die Linebacker-Mission, in Vietnam sagt man Yen Yen Phu in der Luft, in Amerika sagt man der Elf-Tage-Krieg, in Vietnam sagt man der Zwölf-Tage-Krieg. Dieser eine Tagunterschied dauert in Vietnam bis heute an.
80er Jahren wurden Nuklearwaffen verstärkt ins Waffenprogramm der B-52 wieder aufgenommen. Gleichzeitig treffen die USA und die Sowjetunion das Startabkommen zur Reduzierung strategischer Waffen. Der Golfkrieg 1991. 45 B-52 werden eingesetzt, zum ersten Mal ausgerüstet mit Calcoms. Konventionelle, aus der Luft abgefeuerte Cruise Missiles für chirurgische Operationen gegen militärische Anlagen in und um Bagdad. Die irakische Armee wird mit einem Bombenteppich belegt und ist mit wenigen Einsätzen ausgelöscht. Desert Strike 1996. E-52-Bomber greifen Bagdad an. Dieses Ding kann überall auf der Welt hinlangen, sagte ein Sergeant und zeigte auf den Bomber hinter sich. Und das heißt, wir haben überall auf der Welt die Macht. Dezember 1998. Während Präsident Clinton der Impeachment-Prozess gemacht wird, kehren 15 B-52-Bomber nach Irak zurück. Die Operation Desert Fox. Stecknadelgenau flogen die Cruise Missiles ins Ziel. Mit dem Verschwinden der Sowjetunion aus dem Kalten Krieg wird wieder möglich, auf begrenzte Weise einen Krieg zu führen. Begrenzte Territorien, unterlegene Gegner. Es geht nicht mehr darum, ein umkämpftes Terrain massiv auf Breitenwirkung bedacht zu bombardieren. Das Ziel ist, die gegnerische Nation militärisch zu kontrollieren, ohne sie zu zerstören. Das heißt, man muss Objekte treffen, nicht die Leute. Daraus folgt, die Menschen sind im Krieg vollends unwichtig geworden. Im März 1999 werden sechs B-52 im Kosovo-Krieg eingesetzt. Sie feuern drei Dutzend Cruise Missiles ab. Clearly it's the best weapon system ever built. You think so? Uh, Why is that? Well, it's flexibility and versatility. An airplane's been a high-altitude nuclear bomber, a low-altitude nuclear bomber, conventional bombs, uh, standoff missiles, from the very earliest hound dogs right on up to the advanced cruise missile today. Missiles today are both conventional and nuclear. The conventional bombs today can be either smart or dumb. Uh, it has it carries the harpoon missile, anti-ship, it has deep sea mining, and there's no other airplane ever built that can do the jobs it does. There were some design problems early on, as there are with most airplanes. There was a period when uh, uh, they were having problems with the tail. They solved that problem. Uh, What about the, what do you think the future of the B-52 will be? Of course, originally it was a device in the defense system during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I, I tell you what the current position of the Air Force is. The airplane will be flying until 2037. It will outlast the B-1 and the B-2. They will go into retirement before the B-52. That's what the current plan says. Plans change virtually every year depending on different situations. More important, depending on political considerations. Uh, there's some unhappiness with that because what that means is they're not going to start looking at a replacement. Uh, the bombers we have now will be the bombers we fly for the next 20 years or so. And then. So there's arguments for and against that. The, the point is that the airplane can still do probably twice as much as any other aircraft we have. It just has that capability. Uh, we can't replace the missions that it can do. Uh, the B-1 and the B-2 can't do all the things that the B-52 can do. How long it'll stay? I don't think it'll be around until 2037. I think uh, economically they'll decide, I think they'll decide to replace the airplane sooner. The airplanes we fly today are 37 years old, but airframe-wise, they're fairly young airplanes. The H model did not fly in Southeast Asia. 
so it didn't build up all those all those hours on the airplane that the D model did. We wore the D models out. Uh, each model, most of them have something in the neighborhood of 14,000 hours, which isn't a lot of hours on a big airplane. So the airplane physically can last for a lot longer, whether they'll decide to keep upgrading the avionics and so forth. They have announced recently that they are going to upgrade the, the avionics inside, uh, so it will be a modern airplane again. It gives us an ability to to have a heavy presence overseas very quickly. That nothing else can give us. Uh, also, it's a it's a poli again a political symbol. When you base we forward deploy B-52s, the other side knows you're serious. Uh, as you know, the first strike launched against Iraq was B-52s. Yeah. The first attack against uh, Kosovo was. B-52s out of Fairfield. Mehr als 100 B-52 sind in den letzten 50 Jahren abgestürzt. Fast ein Siebtel der gesamten Produktion. 24 Flugzeuge allein im Krieg in Vietnam. Hunderte B-52 stehen in der Wüste und warten darauf, ausgeschlachtet oder verschrottet zu werden, gemäß dem Startabkommen. Der Druck der militärischen Produktion schiebt seine Erzeugnisse wie eine gewaltige Endmoräne von Schrott vor sich her. Zu denken, dass der Kalte Krieg nur eine Erfindung war, ein Knall, der nie laut wurde. Well, AMARC is the Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Center. And basically for the Department of Defense, we store airplanes, we reclaim parts. Uh, we actually have part, uh, airplanes that fly out yeah. that are what we call regenerated. And then, of course, we uh, uh, dispose of parts. So basically, we have four processes. Uh, the first process is where we uh, have an airplane uh, that will have an opportunity to, to go back out. The airplanes that are identified by their systems program manager that had a chance to fly again. Uh, example would be the F-4s are, are, are flying again. They're in the dro drone program. And we just recently took out some F-18s for the Spanish Air Force. So we will protect it with the uh, coating that we call spray lat, which is a very thin plastic uh, type coating that we put on it. Uh, and then every four years, we'll bring the airplane in. We'll take the spray lat off of it. We'll look for any corrosion, which we normally don't have a whole lot because it's very dry here. So we'll bring the airplane in. We will uh, refuel it. We will run the engines. We will check the systems. Uh, then what we will do is we'll re-preserve it and put it back out in the desert. The second category is that the airplane itself isn't going out, but we may need the parts. What are the parts you retrieve from the B-52s that are out there in the desert? Well, for the, for, for the B-52s, uh, we just recently, uh, with stuff that was going on with Iraq, as well as what's going on, uh, on over uh, in the European theater, Uh, we've had to pull gears, landing gears, for the B-52s. They're, okay. they're in uh, heavy use, yeah. yeah. The problem that we have is that uh, there's not a whole lot of B-52s still around. Yeah. We have the G models here. The, the Air Force is flying the H models. Yeah. But a lot of the parts are interchangeable mm -hmm. on the two mm -hmm. uh, models. I see. Uh, basically what happens is once we uh, have uh, cut the airplane, we will have contractors that will bid on the scrap metal for the B-52. Uh, and what they will do is they will pay whatever the price of the metals is for the time period that they're, that they're buying it. A B-52, uh, the last one I think that got sold uh, was about $50,000. One of the interesting things is one of the companies that uh, buys the, uh, the metals, they uh, get the scrap, uh, they take it in a truck up to Michigan, it's remelted and it becomes another airplane. Yeah. So that's kind of neat. It, yeah, uh, yeah. it lives on. It uh, yeah. has another life.
Vier Stifte von der Größe einer Milchflasche halten die Flügel am Rumpf. Eine denkbar einfache Mechanik. Es braucht aber einen Kran und eine fünf Tonnen schwere Metallplatte, den Flügel vom Rumpf zu trennen. Es braucht vier Männer, eine B-52 zu vernichten. Sie zu bauen, benötigt es Tausende von Menschen und 100 Fabriken. Zu viel von jener Vernichtung, die der Bomber in die Welt setzen sollte, ist noch in seiner eigenen Zerstörung anwesend. Wenn etwas ungeschehen gemacht werden soll, müsste man es Schraube für Schraube, Niete für Niete auseinandernehmen. Prior to the aircraft being cut up, a demilitarization process is, is uh, performed on the aircraft, removing all the parts to return them to the operational uh, units or to the depot for rework and put back on the shelf. And then, of course, uh, there are those radioactive materials that are uh, removed and destroyed, and uh, a lot of parts that are Uh, no longer required uh, because the new systems have come online, so those parts are uh, destroyed or turned into DRMO for final disposition. Demilling the aircraft is a very articulate process. Uh, there are many, many parts that are returned to the active inventory, and uh, then those obsolete items that are uh, left on the aircraft for when the aircraft is sold to a contractor after it has been cut. Of course, there are a lot of people who make use of some parts, some for just scrap and some for particular features of the B-52, like nose art or other memorabilia or collectibles. Uh, you've been involved with that as well. The nose art was a, a special project of mine. Uh, as the aircraft arrived and the nose art was still in its prime stage, you might say, I took pictures as the aircraft arrived and uh, made note of it to the Air Force Museum, who immediately twixt back uh, to remove them uh, when it became necessary. Of course, uh, because of the sun taking a toll on the colors, I determined when 
the nose rot would be removed, at which time it, uh, and it's a very uh, tedious process to remove this nose rot because of the thickness of the, the aircraft. Uh, did you pick particular art pieces, no, only there, the best ones? No, there were, the there were 76 aircraft with nose rot on them. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, when, and these are the Desert Storm aircraft, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of air, uh, nose art that were painted over because the aircraft landed or uh, staged out of uh, Saudi Arabia, and that nose art was offensive to that country, so they were required to paint over them. Mm -hmm. So we weren't able to uh, preserve that nose art. But of course you also retrieved certain things uh, from B-52s for your own collection. This is, this is the nose art from, from 61007, when it was stationed at the Fairchild, of course, uh, I understand it has since been painted over. Uh, another piece of nose art has, is presently on it now. I see. But uh, The Metal Mistress was done by Randy Walker, who is the author of uh, a couple of uh, nose art books. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of mine. Of course, I provided a lot of those nose art uh, pictures for him to put in his book. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. But this, is, uh, this was well done. Yeah, so that's your piece. You... Yeah because we're one of the few people that really keep all the gauges that came oh, out of the yeah. B-52. The scrap guys just chop them up. Yeah. We had the opportunity in the past to keep all the gauges yeah. that came out of those aircraft. So you go over there to AMARC and uh, bid? Or? What I will do is I'll work with somebody on, who buys the planes of scrap and say, I need a few parts out of your airplanes and I'll yeah. make a deal to buy the parts. I'm not oh, interested yeah. in the metal, but yeah. there are a few items that I'm interested in. Here's more of, of, of a similar uh, fuel quantity indicator and you know if you went to go build this gauge today go to an instrument company and say I need a fuel quantity gauge that does this this gauge would probably cost you ten thousand yeah. dollars so I have these in surplus so if the if the Air Force eventually runs yeah. out and needs yeah. some for their B-52s yeah. we can get these overhauled yeah. and sell them made back. serviceable again and sell them back to the Air Force and and so that's why I'm keeping this stuff same thing here more of more of a uh, it's another you know the b-52 has eight engines so every and, and lots of fuel tanks and, and lots of fuel storage so they have literally tons of gauges inside them in, in, in aircraft lingo it would be called a solenoid valve but on the street it's called a dump valve and the uh, low riders were the guys who you know build those cars that hop up and down right. need that valve to control the hydraulics for their system that makes their cars bounce up and down. So the B-52s are one of the few sources left of those dump valves. Then the B-52 also has uh, an air compressor that was used in the aircraft to, to you know, to generate uh, breathing air. And we would sell those to dive shops who put them on boats as portable, you know, they hook up filters and modify them whatever the way they need to and they use them to refill uh, scuba tanks on boats. And then uh, there was a, the hoist that was used to lift the bombs inside the B-52. Uh, those are sold to, to people who use them, put them on uh, all-terrain vehicles like four-wheel drives to, to use as a winch to pull them out. So, and then one of the, 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 the other interesting thing are the tires. The tires to the B-52s were sold by the hundreds to somebody who was supplying them to shrimp boats in Louisiana. They were using the tires as bumpers between the boats and the piers.
All die militärischen Geheimnisse der B-52 werden mit einem Male sichtbar und bedeutungslos. Ein Kommunikationssystem und keinen Sinn. Wenn ein Windzug geht, regt sich der Schrott. Auch im Zustand der absoluten Zerstörung will das Flugzeug sich noch immer in die Luft erheben. Kabelbäume von 50 Kilometer Länge gehen durch eine einzige B-52, reinstes Kupfer. Die Stecker und Steckdosen sind aus Gold und Silber. Vielleicht werden aus dem Aluminium wieder neue Flugzeuge gebaut, vielleicht auch nicht. Alles kann weiterverwendet werden. Was ist Recycling? Material sichern, ihm eine neue Funktion geben, ihm eine neue Form geben, einen anderen Zusammenhang finden. I guess it's, it best expresses this quality of uh, a, a, an object that was once tame and gets uh, broken and becomes uh, far more vital. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it has a, this incredible kind of uh, materialistic kineticism yeah. uh, to it. And uh, uh, I can't, it's still my favorite piece. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I like it a lot. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's come alive, you know, yeah. through, we talk about uh, va the violence uh, before, we were talking about that, and for me, uh, It, it sometimes takes that to make something mm -hmm. extraordinary. Yeah, I can't look at metal when it's tamed. It doesn't interest me anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's got this wonderful noise too. We've got, um, you've seen some of these already, the spare bulb lamps. Yeah. Um, I shot JR, um, the bird. The nice thing about the spare lamp boxes, and these were in the tail gunner section, and they mm -hmm. actually would open to reveal spare bulbs for uh, various instruments and, and fuses, but people wrote on the inside, on the outside, um, in, in immense amount of layers of writing in these spare bulb boxes. So this is one of the things we fixated on in the tail gunners section to pull out, because mm -hmm. this is where you found a lot of the most interesting uh, kinds of writing, written by all sorts of people who never intended us to read it. Very private writings in many cases, written in grease pencil, written in pencil pen, girlfriends' names, places, dates. And it was, as Ben said, I think a revelation that this was there because we didn't go looking for that. We went looking for pieces of tangled metal and among the tangled metal we found this writing which um, became rather interesting and took a great deal of effort, I think, to you know, just start to think about what that meant and, and start to decipher it. So you once called it a flying palimpsest. It's sort of an exquisite yeah. corpse in a way, in which one person would write a question, somebody would respond to it, or a statement yeah. and a counter statement. This one has um, both graphite pencil, two colors of grease pencil, and some pen. And depending on how you move it in the light, you catch different levels of writing. So there's lower, deeper levels of writing in graphite, and then on the surface you have the grease pencil. Yeah. Um, when you turn it around, that's where you get the help, I'm being held prisoner inside this ALR 46. Uh, I keep sending signals <laughs> and maintenance never yeah, hears it. Ever fix this piece of shit, so I'll never get out. Uh, this is the first of uh, four installations and um, I was kind of getting a feel for them and uh, at this point was, uh, you know, especially interested in, in um, making it a sort of an encyclopedia of everything about the aircraft so that there are kind of components, uh, you know, the black painted pieces, which uh, is of Vietnam uh, Ds, mostly Ds, uh, not only Ds, but other ones, uh, so that uh, anyone looking at it would be, would be able to see various camouflage colors in here, and so that the, the, the sculpture comes together in that, in that light. Um, the, the part that... Uh, What's in here? Yeah, this is um, um, actually a, a urinal. Uh, for I believe the rear gunner because he was by himself yeah. and it has this wonderful little trigger um, that, that uh, kind of opens it up. It's made in Culver City, uh, San, uh, uh, California. Yeah, Los Angeles. <laughs> and, uh, and you are hiding it in here. Yeah, it's, the, the guys in the office here, they really love it. They, yeah. It's their favorite bit actually. Yeah. 
uh, sure. sort, of, sort of overt things. And then these are pages from uh, the flight manual, the basic flight manual. Mm -hmm. And um, these, these are uh, refueling cells. Uh, you know, this wonderful ominous uh, kind of phallic flight going on. Mm -hmm. And um, here is, I think, for all of us, is a, you know, a very unique piece. It's a, this red a bulb that, um, how should I say, it apparently only went off uh, when the aircraft was going down. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's a particularly succulent ruby red, uh, kind yeah. of testiculate form. Yeah. And uh, apparently when it went off, that was it. Yeah. Uh, and um, So you were on... As a crew member, you were on the verge of life and death. That's, that's in what always. it is. Yeah. And, yeah. and for, you know, the, 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 perhaps the beauty of this project is that you can have in your hand an object like that. And for those people who are part of it, and those people who know the story, uh, it becomes an icon. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it becomes an instrument through which you can relive mm -hmm. uh, the whole experience, well, even as a spectator or yeah. as an observer or as a participant. Mm -hmm. And it's been you know, very good fun to watch the different sorts of objects that we've all collected out of the desert. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been interested in, in pieces that, how should I say, come alive when they're broken. Mm -hmm. um, that metal is tame mm -hmm. and then suddenly it uh, bursts into life when it is stressed out by these incredible forces. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, this is key for me, is to, is to not only have these forms and little stories, but also to find a sort of uh, uh, opiate beauty of metal mm -hmm. and to have within the kind of 20th century technology yes. uh, this, this flip side that mm -hmm. you have tamed rolled metal. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the other, the thing that is left out, uh, that shouldn't be one of the things this project does is it starts to, to meditate and work through this intimate connection between art and war right. that I think we, we tend to want to get rid of. We, we don't want to think about it, but I think it's always there. It haunts it in a way and really asks us to think yeah. about it and grapple with it um, in a way that doesn't sit comfortably with art here, violence here, but starts to think about that, that uh, bridge between the two. Mm -hmm. well, for me, th this is the fascination about the B-52 in, in that it is capable of touching on uh, all facets of contemporary uh, American culture. And that, you know, we can talk about art and war, but we can al also talk about food and war. And we can talk about, uh, you know, cornflakes, people buying, uh, having the, the right to buy 40 different boxes of cornflakes. And if they cannot uh, see that a, the, a military presence makes it possible to have that choice, uh, then there's a problem. Uh, that, that uh, for me, um, in the end, if you separate anything, if you kind of put art and war into different boxes, that's a problem. If you put art, war and domesticity uh, in separate boxes, it's an even greater problem. You know, the, the B-52 uh, touches on all of these sentiments, uh, internationally, nationally, popular culture, graffiti, sexuality, right. you know, technology. I mean, there's nothing left out. Uh, and, and it's one object. That's what I like about it so much. It is an object. It's a thing. It is a um, palimpsest in three dimensions, not only textual, uh, but it's a palimpsest that touches every facet of, of uh, what we're up to. Do you consider this work, your work, with the B-52 also as a form of recycling? I mean, you, you have to get into the history of metals uh, before answering that. And, and uh, you know, there's this wonderful story that um, the bronze tiles uh, from uh, Hadrian's um, uh, Pantheon uh, were melted down to make cannon for a pope who was holding out in Hadrian's tomb, Castel uh, Angelo. And then that bronze moved over to make Bernini's uh, uh, Boldaccino in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the guys who made that uh, Boldaccino, they probably knew, in fact, they would have known where that metal came from, that it was mm -hmm. pagan metal from a pagan temple processed to make a military uh, cannon for a pope who then took it off to make Bernini's masterpiece, or one of his masterpieces.
ganz 100 Flugzeuge sind von der Flotte der B-52 übergeblieben und noch im Dienst. Alle vier Jahre kehren sie nach Oklahoma zurück, um inspiziert zu werden. Hier taucht die B-52 als Arbeitsplatz wieder auf. Die Düsenmaschinen werden überholt und repariert. Die Kabel- und Seilzüge werden erneuert. Alle Systeme und Instrumente werden getestet. Korrosion wird behandelt, Risse und Brüche werden ausgebessert. Alle konstruktiven Elemente werden untersucht. Geräte werden regeneriert, modifiziert und umgerüstet. Kein Detail, das nicht in Augenschein genommen wird. wird beinahe ein zweites Mal gebaut. Als ob man den Deckel einer Mechanik abhebt, um ihre Ingeniosität noch einmal bewundern zu können, bevor sie vollständig obsolet wird. Der wahre Schauplatz des Kalten Krieges waren vielleicht die Produktionsstätten. never lost our nuclear capability in, in that function of the airplane. Part of our global reach, global power mission that we have is its ability to strike anywhere in the world from home station without having to forward deploy uh, and, and be ready on a drop of a dime. What's a global, the global power mission? How can one define that? Global power essentially uh, is our ability to generate an airplane here, load it with weapons, and strike anywhere in the world. And uh, global reach, global power, uh, force projection, if you will, uh, without having to open up another base somewhere and, and deploy in there, uh, and all the assets and support equipment and all that. We can do it from here, from Minot. You are uh, simulating a cluster bombs, CBU 87s. Uh, so that means you're going to be getting into the CF-530. You're simulating a full load of CBUs. Your uh, min airspeed for release is 350. Your max airspeed is 390 indicated. Min altitude is not a, a factor. You can go down to 1550 AGL. And a max altitude is 45,000 feet. Actually, that's as high as the chart goes on the CBU-87. The uh, latest change for the stats page is 3 May 99. Uh, the metro is uh, Minot and Ellsworth. Clearance plane settings, IR-492. Is 400 day, you'll be day, so November Lima to November Sierra. Then it's uh, 1,000 feet from November Sierra over to Alpha Victor, which is your EMA on the first bomb run. Alpha Victor to Lima Fox will be uh, 400 feet. Lima Fox, right down here. And then it's 1,000 feet all the way out to Alpha Kilo. We all know why that's, it's a nice sensitive. You could use the alternate TA eval area, if you like, for 485 to do additional TA cal. The terrain in the area is 3250. You fly 4050. And you can do that from uh, Lima Oscar, which is three quarters of the way through the turn, down to 4550. Uh, you've got another noise sensitive area, long track here. Treat that as a threat. Uh, Lima Delta through Lima Echo is your MOA. You're allowed to maneuver anywhere in the MOA. You do own that time while you're there. If you see Leeds weapons going off by 29 TG, you're clear to go back down to uh, your release altitude, okay? This again is a, is a pop to level maneuver. So you'll be, uh, uh, your navs will be uh, directing a climb to 48, 25 minimum for the weapon for release, okay? 
simulating a full load of external, that gives you 10 weapons. So you're going to descend right into that frag pattern if you push the nose over and descend to get out of the threat environment. So what you have to do is you have to calculate the uh, stop release time plus the train, uh, time of fall plus the, uh, the cylinder, which is about a half mile, which is about five seconds. Add those three amounts up and that is your start descent time. And the nav, nav has to call that out to the crew before you push the nose over and descend back down. Die Erwartung einer B-52 beträgt 70 Jahre. Das Flugzeug wird alle Bomber überleben, die gegenwärtig in Dienst stehen. Kein anderes Flugzeug weist solche Reichweite auf oder ähnliche Vielseitigkeit. Es wird weiterleben und es ist obsolet. Die B-52 ist bislang immer unterhalb ihrer Kapazität eingesetzt worden. Das mag heißen, das Schlimmste haben wir hinter uns. Es kann aber auch heißen, es steht uns noch bevor. Der Kalte Krieg ist vorbei, aber seine Waffen sind immer noch da. werden können, so beweist die B-52 als Maschine das Gegenteil. <lacht> 